Does it like export or convert into other languages? No. So, so Rust is a thing on its own. Um, okay. Rust is basically, um, uh, it's, I shouldn't say it's a competitor because, although it is in a way, but it sort of it sits on the level of C. Okay. Okay. Um, we see, you know, a lot of problems. I mean, I saw a, a graph from Microsoft, I uh, can't remember how long ago, maybe about a year and a half ago or so, where they did some, some research and looked at all their bugs and so forth, and they figured out that 70% of all their bugs across all their products, okay, is related to uh, um, memory issues. In other words, um, not clearing up memory when you've used it and so forth, dangling pointers and this type of stuff. And, and they were saying 70% of the, the bugs are because of that. And that is from C now. Um, well, you'll have a similar problem with C++, but in C. So what Rust tries to do is to circumvent some of those problems that C, you shouldn't say problems actually though. Um, for general day-to-day -day coding, all right, um, you don't always have the time to sit and go through your C code and make sure that you are freeing your memory and so forth. Um, so Rust, you don't have to think about that stuff. Um, you can just code because it's built into the, the compiler to do these checks for you and it'll warn you about these things. Um, so, so Rust is sort of a, an extension, if I can rather say, of, of the C way of thinking. Um, and it solves similar problems. It's, it's super fast. Um, it doesn't have a, a garbage collector, uh, which a lot of people will think, for instance, um, you know, because it's, it's so memory safe and so forth, well, it must have a garbage collector to clear up all these dangling points, you know, all the memory that it's pointing to and so forth. Well, it doesn't really work that way. Um, you know, at compile time, it checks and makes sure that you, you, you're, you're coding correctly and so forth, and it would not build an executable if you, if you made certain mistakes. So it forces you to, to, to code in a way that's not going to allow these these memory issues and pointer issues to become an issue. Um, now, on the C side, you could say, well, okay, so that's a problem with C, so oh, we shouldn't be using C, we should be moving over to Rust then. Well, no, not necessarily. C is a brilliant tool for what it is used for. And, and if that is what you need it for, then that is what you should be using. So one can't say, for instance, a a Formula One car, for instance, is better than a rally car. Uh, they're two different things. Okay, they, they've got different use cases. So, so a direct comp comparison between the two to say one is better than the other is not fair at all. But to say that uh, the one solves certain problems that you could find with, like, let's say, C now, uh, that is true. Um, but it's not really a direct competition, you know, to say that one is better than the other. I mean, if you look at uh, Linux itself, I mean, most of that is written in C and Assembler. And uh, when uh, a couple of months ago, I think now, uh, Linus Torvalds was actually saying that he, he's considering allowing some Rust code to, to get into the kernel, but over a period of time, there's still tests to be done and so forth. And, and I think that's absolutely brilliant um, because C is fast, uh, sorry, Rust is very, very fast. Um, and, and, it's, and it's memory safe, and, and it's con a concurrency as well. So if you've got multiple threads and so forth, um, you know, like I do a lot of C-sharp development as well. And, and for instance, in C-sharp, if you try and access a, a certain structures uh, from different threads, um, you're going to have certain concurrency issues. Uh, you know, variables are going to change values unexpectedly and so forth. Now with Rust, that's far less of a problem. You will have the same problem, if we can call it a problem with C, but that is by design. C, C was created a certain way for a reason. Um, you as a developer should be aware of the pitfalls that there are, and you should be coding to prevent those things. All right. And if you are aware of them, which any good C coder should be, then it's not really that much of an issue. But in that same sense, Rust is probably quicker to develop with because you don't have to worry about those specific problems. Yeah. So it's not, yeah. it's, it, they are competitors, but you know, I, I like both of them and I understand both of them have got their place. Um, yeah. It's not really, you can't really say that one is better than the other in every single situation. What it, it depends yeah. what you're referring to.
That was a beautiful explanation. I'm gonna have to. What I'm gonna have to do is take that and merge it into the interview because I haven't even technically started it yet. <laughs> oh, I, I, I actually wanted to ask you. Um, yeah, you're asking me, but did we start yet? <laughs> so no. okay, but you know, I actually. All right, you just tell me when, when we started. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Well, some. Um, because I wanted to kind of chat a little bit before, but yeah, I actually read, sure. uh, sometimes I'll go read the uh, the mailing list and, and Li- uh, Linus goes off on some of the, the way that C development has progressed and like how <laughs> some of the stuff yes. they've done. <laughs> Is that really, yes. Like I don't understand exactly what he's talking about, but in general, I'm like, man, he's got, he's, he's got some hostility towards some of the way they've programmed C to function. Well, the thing is, you know, he's a, he's a perfectionist and, and grant him that, you know, yeah. I, for a lot of companies that I've worked at, I, I've, I've been a, a consultant for, for many years and I was a contractor for many years and I've also worked permanently at companies for many years. So I've worked at many, many different companies. And um, the thing is what a lot of business people don't understand, all right, is that IT guys, real hardcore IT guys, okay, we are not there to sit and, you know, sit around a table on a Friday afternoon and I don't know, we're different, you know, we, we have different conversations, uh, we get excited about different things, we have different personalities than, than the average person that you'll meet in a company, okay, um, maybe, you know, I can't even think of an example of who, but, but like take a programmer for instance, um, not all of them, but a large percentage of them they only get along with other programmers. Uh, you know, they, they, they've all got some social anxiety or something. <laughs> There's a reason that they are developers. You know, you, you don't get some guy that, I don't know, I can't even think of a good example, but some, you know, they're normally more introverted and so forth. So to try and get these people to be part of a crowd and to, you know, sing la 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 with everyone and so forth, that aren't developers. It doesn't really work that well. So, so Linus is an exact example of a developer like that. So his personality hasn't changed, all right, because that's who he is, but it causes him problems because he's stuck in a situation where he has to deal with people in the outside world, which most developers don't have to, but he has to. So it's very difficult for him to try and put on a different hat and talk to people in, in, in a, a more uh, socially accepted way. You know, he talks to them like how developers will talk to each other. And you know, if one developer messed up badly, you tell the developer, hey, dude, you totally messed up. The security for the system is messed up and you're going to be hacked. Okay, you don't do that. Don't be stupid now. Um, you can say that to another hardcore developer. Um, but, you know, saying it to someone that's not like that. Um, they take it extremely uh, personally. Um, so when I hear uh, Linus said something or like he showed his middle finger to NVIDIA that time, um, mm-hmm. well, that's him. You know, that's cool. I don't have problems with that. Yeah, that's the, um, I kind cause, of... Because I see, him, I see him as a developer trying yeah. to make it in the, in the social world. Um, but yeah, so, so there's definitely a difference between, you know, some hardcore IT type people and normal people, if I can call them that, um, that aren't so hardcore into IT. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way about Linus. You know, when I hear about like some of his rants and stuff, and I just admire how spirited he is about, you know, uh, about how his his method, his approach to things. And I think a lot of the success of Linux is, can be attributed to his approach. So I don't think it's like a negative thing. Oh, most thing, definitely. Yes. Know? No, I, I mean, they, I, I did read the other day... Um, that Linus is working on something like one percent of the kernel at the moment, but but he's still you know he's checking code and everything. He's still very very busy, but he's not like fifty percent of the code is not you know sitting on his desktop. You know he he's doing very little of the actual coding nowadays. But he started this whole paradigm, this whole way of thinking, and and the rules that that the developers must be governed by that writes the kernel. Um, and now there's a lot of people that think similar to him that work with him and so forth. So you can allow these other guys to sort of take over and so forth. Um, because, I mean, imagine if he was fully in control and something had to happen to him tomorrow. What is going to happen to, to, to Linux in the future? You know, we've yeah. we got a big problem. So it's a good thing to, to spread this knowledge amongst other developers. But he's still got a very strong hold on, on what gets done. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, if you look at, uh, um, I was just reading something on OpenBSD today 
um because i'm very interested in in bsd as well and um uh what do i want to say to you now um what was i reading on open bsd uh and we were talking about Linux. sorry my memory goes bang like this often oh, um cool. we were talking something about I read something that they said something. What was it? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Um, they actually have a foundation for for. Uh, sorry, that's for free BSD, not open BSD. They have a foundation, and it it, it looks like people are actually voted in uh, into the the management every two years. A new vote is held, so you can be kicked out or kept in. Now, now in a way, that's also good. You know, I, I like that as well because they're actually looking at people that can actually look after the code. They're not like, you know, best friends and it's, well, best friends is great. Baker Linux distro, that's, that's beautiful. But I mean, when you're starting to talk on, on certain things where very big companies are basing millions and millions and millions of dollars on this operating system, they're relying on it to work for whatever reason, you know, maybe they want to fly to Mars or whatever the case may be, uh, the kernel must work, all right? So you need people that are out there that actually make sure that things are done properly. And that's what Linus does beautifully, I think. Um, he is not a people person, and he's not pretending to be, and we shouldn't think that he is a people person, so we shouldn't treat him like one. Yeah, um, I agree. You know, a normal totally. CEO in a company is far more a people person than what Linus is, but I mean the, the 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 contribution that he's made in the computing world is much higher than a lot of CEOs of big IT companies out there. Absolutely. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and do my intro now because we kind of got sure. the we kind of got the interview started backwards. I might just I might just post it as is. So, um, but yeah, let me go ahead and do my <laughs> intro because I need to do it. Well, you're um, welcome to do that as well. You could just you know I don't know how you do it, but maybe you can just say like, the plans was to have it, but <laughs> we kicked off and yeah. <laughs> he said I don't know. Just start chatting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, welcome to the Lead Request Podcast. My name is Matt, and this is episode 47. I'm joined by a 30 year developer, Linux user, and content creator, Dean from. Uh, IT and the likes on YouTube and uh, yeah, that's my intro. So, <laughs> but we can continue <laughs> the conversation now. Yeah. So, so yeah, you. Well, yeah. So, yeah, but yeah, I totally agree on the on the on the uh, on the Linus thing, and I kind of feel the same way about. Um, I know that, uh, like I was saying to somebody the other the other day about uh, Stallman, is that there's like my kind of view on Stallman is there's people who who don't like him. And there's people, or yeah, they don't like him at all. There's people who support him, but no, <laughs> but it seems like nobody really likes him. You know, like there's maybe people I that feel support the same him. Way. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so I've thing only made, I've only, I've only made one video. All right, where yeah, I well, mentioned yeah. anyone in particular, and it happened to be him, and. I didn't want to get too deep into my opinions about him, but I did want to say to people like, hey, it's okay to make up your own mind, right? Don't listen yeah. to what everyone tells you like, oh, we're all into open source and all this stuff and so is he, so therefore he's a good guy. Um, that is not my opinion. I don't think he's the, the greatest guy out there, but that doesn't hold me back from you know using tools and stuff that he was involved in creating. I mean, if you really wanted to go so far and say, well, just because I disagree with someone's politics, I I'm not going to, or, or they, you know, the type of person they are. So I'm not going to use their product. Well, then, you know, maybe you disagree with, you know, uh, communism. Then, then why are you using products that come from China, for instance? Um, you know, there's a point where you've got to cut it off, and you've got to decide, you know, wh what do you get out of it, and what do you lose in the battle? And and I think for for us normal people that that are using, you know, the new utilities and so forth, um, I don't think that should really affect us. Um, you can have your opinion about them. I, you know, I suppose everyone can have opinions about everyone, um, and and that's fine. But you know, if someone has a different opinion than you, as long as they thought their opinion out. I say this about a lot of things in life. You might be different to me. You might have a different idea than me, but at least have thought your idea out, and and then I have respect for it. But if you just go along with the crowd, um, and and then want to make an argument about what you think the crowd thinks. Um, that, is, that doesn't hold much more water with me. You know, it's have your own ideas, but at least think them through and then have a reason for your ideas. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I would totally agree. I think, you know, uh, I don't know. It's, it's quite a dynamic with, with uh, Stallman uh, specifically, but, you know, it's, it's the, whole, the, whole, <laughs> the whole thing is, 
a bit confusing, but you know, I think a lot of people agree uh, with the ideas that Stallman has. Uh, but uh, yes. as, in regard to software freedom, uh, uh, freedom yes. respecting software and that sort of thing, and, and and the work that he began in, I guess it would have been what 1983. 84, somewhere around there? Sure, I don't, I don't yeah. even know, but yes, it's been ages ago. Yeah, yeah. ages ago. Um, but yeah, um, so switching switching off that topic, uh, you, you do development, and you had told me a little bit earlier uh, what languages you use uh, primarily, and I was wondering if you could list those again, like your development languages that you use. Oh, okay. Well, there's quite a list here. <laughs> Let me go to my website quickly to remind myself <laughs> sure. of oh, everything. Yeah. And what was uh, your what was your website again? It's uh, dimension15.co.za. So it's dimension15.co.za. Uh, like I said, that was my first Angular website I ever created. Um, so yes. Yeah, so so put it to this way. When I started developing, I wrote my first program in 1986. It was on a ZX Spectrum, uh, written in, I wrote in BASIC back then. Uh, it was just some silly little thing where you do little mass, uh, little mass quizzes, and every time you get your, the question right, then the screen changes colors, and you know, that, that's what I could do back in 1980. I don't even think it was 86, it might have been 84, now that I think of it. But, um, and, and I was fiddling around and so forth, but nothing too serious. And then uh, towards the end of schooling, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be, uh, my father was a computer engineer and um, he got me interested in electronics and computers and so forth. I would often go to work with him and help him. Back then uh, in the late 70s and so forth, he was working with a company called ICL, uh, which I don't think they exist now anymore. But um, he was working on mainframes and so forth. So I was interested in, in computers and electronics and so forth. But, but come the end of uh, my, my final year at school, um, I, I was choosing, or I wanted to choose be, between either marine biology or astrophysics, and I couldn't decide which one. So I decided to do my military uh, training instead. Um, back then, you, you didn't have a choice. We had to go. Um, if you didn't go, um, you'd either have to have proof that you went uh, to a university or something, and then when that is finished, you've got to go. Um, alternatively, you get a letter from your work or whatever telling you that, okay, you don't have to go this year. But the government was saying, you know, it was forced. You, you, it was conscription. You had to go to the, to the army, if we can call it that. And uh, so I thought I'll take that, and then in there I'll decide, you know, what am I actually going to do? And then... Um, I started working at a place, I was the head guard at a place called the Software Depot, where they wrote the software for a, uh, a, a, a jet that they had in South Africa called the Cheetah. And um, there was an American lieutenant, uh, one of the programmers that was working on this software, and uh, I walked past him the one day, we all knew each other, and I just made this joke and I said, ah, what you're writing is easy. And uh, I walked off and he then turned around, he came and he sat next to me in my office. Just, I had a, a little a computer there, I uh, didn't have use for it, but I had a computer and he said, okay, watch me. And he sat by me for two days and he wrote a program in Pascal. And uh, he told me, okay, Mr. Know-it-all, now you go and write it. And then <laughs> three days later, I'd rewritten it. And he said, okay, the choice is made, you go and be a programmer. Nice. And that's then what I ended up going and doing. But so you're asking me about my languages. So I basically started my very first language I ever used was was there for basic. But when I really started coding, it was uh, Pascal and Assembler. And uh, the reason why I actually did Assembler was um, back in those days we uh, we had uh, CGA color, and if I remember correctly, it was only four colors. Uh, if I remember correctly, but. Um, Borland, the company Borland existed back then as well, and they had something called a BGI driver, which allowed for 256 colors. So of course we, we've we got the, the the you know the 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 monochrome, so the Hercules graphics cards and so forth, CGA, and so it moves up, um, and we finally ended up with 256 colors. But there wasn't a driver from Borland available for Pascal to use, so that's where why I started playing with Assembler. So I wrote my own color driver. So when everyone else was using four colors or 16 colors in Pascal, I was already using my 256 because of my assembler knowledge. And then from assembler and so forth and Pascal, I moved over to C++, uh, Borland C++ to be specific. 
and uh, then I also moved over to Delphi and uh, really enjoyed Delphi. Um, but then I had to make a decision, um, a business decision. Um, in South Africa, what is going to be more supported in the future? Visual Basic uh, from Microsoft or Delphi? And it hurt me, and it still hurts me to say this, but I, I chose Visual Basic. So I thought uh, there's more of a future in that um, career-wise in South Africa. And uh, it turns out I did make the right decision there. But uh, so I, I did a lot of Visual Basic uh, development. Started with the Visual Basic version three, and I did every single version since then, um, uh, from you know normal up VB6 and then into VB.NET as well. Um, but I tried to do as little in VB.NET as humanly possible. Um, but while I was doing uh, the Visual Basic stuff, I wanted to what I considered you know keep, keep myself more pure, a more pure programmer. And uh, so therefore I still did C++ at the same time. And a lot of companies where I got hired because uh, I had Visual Basic on my CV, I often ended up having to write C++ stuff for them because none of the other programmers could, they all just knew Visual Basic. So, so there we got, we got Basic, then Pascal Assembler, uh, x86 X Assembler, uh, C, C++, um, what's that, Visual Basic. And then in approximately, what was it, 2001, I think it was, yeah. Um, I started with C Sharp, and uh, I started making big moves to try and get away from Visual Basic. Um, then from C Sharp, uh, I still do C Sharp today, um, but from C Sharp, C Sharp was probably my main language for, for well, for, for the 20 years since then. But if, if all the other things that I've been working in uh, is, well, like I said earlier, there, there's PHP, um, then there's all the frameworks, for instance, so you've got ASP.NET, MVC, .NET Core, and all that kind of stuff. I've done all that. Um, for, for web development, my favorite at the moment is Angular. Um, I've, I, I've looked a little bit at Flutter, um, but I still I prefer... Uh, well, okay, so Flutter and Angular on direct, direct competitors is more Ionic and Flutter. And so I do Ionic as well um, for mobile development. And I've also done Xamarin for mobile development. Um, Xamarin, uh, Xamarin forms in specific, not just pure Xamarin. Um, I, I prefer Ionic for mobile development. But yeah, I would say nowadays, um, if I have any say in it, then 100% uh, of my time will be spent in Rust. But for practical purposes and for you know employment and so forth, uh, I probably write twenty five percent C sharp and the rest is Rust. And then when I do get to do websites and so forth, then it's your normal web technology, so your JavaScript and CSS and HTML and that type of stuff. Um, my favorite languages that I've ever worked in would probably be oh I did Clarion as well at a stage. But uh, I would say that my favorite ones is Pascal x86 assembler um c c plus plus rust and i'll throw c sharp in there because it it did me good over the years um but if i could choose then i'd rather spend all my time in something like c rust and assembler that that's the kind of places i like playing around with it's in there yeah Wow, that's a yeah, that's an amazingly, <laughs> that's an incredible list. And you you told me that you did, uh, you've done the thirty years professional development, but you've developed a lot longer than that. And so yeah, I so I mean, uh, my f I, I actually come from uh, what used to be called Southwest Africa. It's now called Namibia. Um, okay. It's just to the it's it's a neighboring country just to the north w uh, west of South Africa. Um, it's almost the size of South Africa, but. Uh, when we moved from South, from Namibia to South Africa, I think that was in 1983 or 84. I can't remember now. I think 83. Um, but when we moved from there, the entire country's population was 1.1 million people. Wow. Now, to give you an idea, Johannesburg in South Africa at that stage had almost 2 million people. So a country almost the size of South Africa had half the amount of people as one city in, in, in South Africa. So growing up there was really wonderful. You know, I grew up playing in the bush and so forth, um, you know, which people nowadays living in cities and so forth. And the dangers nowadays, you can't just go and play in the bush, you know, something could happen to you. But back in the 70s, 
I could go and play in the bush. We were in the bush constantly, up in the mountains and stuff. We would gather you know, scorpions and, and all sorts of things. We would play around with everything. Um, but what I'm getting at, too, is you're talking about from, from way back. So I did play a little bit of Atari uh, games back in the 70s, but I myself didn't have an Atari. A friend of mine had. Uh, we also didn't have television back then. Um, South Africa got, I think, in 76 or 77, they got television. Uh, uh, Namibia, I think, they were going to get television in 1982, but I think it only happened in 83, if I remember correctly. But so we didn't really have anything. Uh, one friend had an Atari. There was no TV. Um, so we were outside playing. Um, but that was my first introduction to, if we can say, a computer. It was an Atari. And yeah. then from then coming over to South Africa, um, my dad actually brought home one day a ZX81. Um, it's a tiny little Mickey Mouse computer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, and I, I had that for, I can't even remember how long. It wasn't very long. But I, I think he saw very quickly that it's not going to do the job. And then he got the ZX Spectrum with 16 kilobytes of RAM. All right. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I saved up money, you know, pocket money and so forth. And I could finally upgrade my 16 kilobytes to 32 kilobytes. And I really thought I've got some real special computer here. But um, later, I think the last one uh, that was released was 128 kilobytes, if I remember correctly. But that was a few years later. Um, but then after that, um, I still had my ZX Spectrum. And then as the years progressed, the guys started getting into, you know, the the the, the Amiga, the Commodores, um, and you know, all all those. I can't remember all the the the, the console names and stuff anymore. But uh, I know my friends had the Amigas, brilliant computers back then. Uh, my one friend's father had the uh, Archimedes. I think it's the Acorn Archimedes. Um, that was a risk uh, processor. That that was extremely fast. A couple of years later, when I ended up with my 386DX40. Um, we did a comparison. Uh, there was a there's a package called Coral Draw, and yeah. uh, back then I was on version 2.1, if I remember correctly. Now this is in the 90s now already, early 90s, and uh, there was a, 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 a rendering or a, 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 um, a vector of a chameleon's head, and um, he, my friend's father, that had this uh, uh, Archimedes. He had a program that could also read uh, uh, Coral Draw files. So what we did is, I, on my computer, on my 386DX40, I opened this, uh, this head of this chameleon, and it'll be folded, it'll be drawn, it'll be rendered, and I would time it, and it took 36 seconds. And I thought, yeah, wow. my 386, <laughs> like, wow, amazing. Yeah. And then we, I took the file to him, and we put it on his computer, and six seconds. Exactly six times faster than my 386DX40. Now, that is, that is right wow. when the DX40 was available here. Yeah. So it was brand new. And he had that machine for like two years already. And it was six times faster than my DX40. And what, machine was, what machine was his? It was a, uh, uh, an Archimedes. And I yeah. think it's uh, from Acorn. The company was called Acorn. And you said it was uh, a RISC Acorn. system. It was a RISC, yeah. 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 That's impressive. That's crazy impressive. Especially, yes, it was <laughs> wow. ridiculous. It was amazing. Yeah. But what was also very interesting is the operating system. Um, you know, like now, well, I mean, it, it, nowadays it, it won't fly. But, but back in those days, you know, you'd have your, um, like you'll have a sound blaster, for instance, that's got, well, I don't know if that's a good example, a little bit of memory on it and a video card. It's got a little bit of memory on it and, and so forth. But typically, you know, it's just using the system memory. But what that operating system could do is, let's say, for instance, he's, he was working on, on a spreadsheet, for instance, and then we would come along, and, you know, and the sons, his sons, two sons with the Amigas, they would tell me, oh, but you must see this demo on my dad's computer. And then they go to the dad and they say, please show us this demo. And then he say, well, you know, it's a 256 color demo and so forth, and uh, the, the video card doesn't have enough RAM. All right, to be able to play this 256 color demo. Mm. But he had these sliders in the operating system at the bottom where like a taskbar would be. He had these sliders on there. And you could then, as you move these sliders, you're actually giving RAM to different components of the system. So you could just drag the, the video card slider up a bit and then it'll have access to more RAM. It was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, we're crazy. talking, yeah, like, I don't know, maybe 90. 
92 maybe around yeah. there. That was an amazing concept back then. You yeah, could just want, drag these yeah. sliders I want and give today. more RAM to. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. I want I want uh, memory sliders on my system. Yeah, I'd love it as well, (laughs) especially if it is connected to the internet and I can just drag down terabytes of memory. (laughs) It would be amazing. (laughs) Right. That would would be revolutionary. It would be amazing. Yeah, totally. (laughs) So, yeah, yeah, um, I think it's awesome that you're from South Africa. That's so cool. Um, (laughs) I don't know. I'm just intrigued by uh, South Africa. I'm Actually, I'm just intrigued by language in general. I I love to learn different languages and stuff. And you you mentioned you were were required to do uh, military. And I was wondering, is it really like in the movies where you had to speak Afrikaans? Well, it's not, yeah. Are you referring to just in general in South Africa or in the military itself? Yeah, in the military, because I've seen some movies. It's okay. like, yeah, they're like, broad Afrikaans. So, yes. You know? <laughs> in, in, the military, in the military, you had problems if you couldn't speak Afrikaans. Because, yeah. you know, the government back then was, uh, what was it called? The National Party. Yeah, the National Party. But they were basically mostly Afrikaans speaking. And, and therefore, you know, the military being obviously a government institution, mm. most of them were also Afrikaans speaking. So if you can speak Afrikaans, you would, have, you would get in trouble a lot. Um, but it wasn't really that much of an issue for, for us because we all spoke Afrikaans anyway. Um, I mean, even coming from, South, from Namibia um, to South Africa, there we also spoke Afrikaans. So you know, it, it's not like, I, I'd say the... Nowadays, okay, I do come across English-speaking South Africans that have been in this country for decades that don't... My own sister is not very good at speaking Afrikaans, for instance. Um, and I mean, she, I'm 50 and she's 47, so she, she's, she's had the opportunity. But it's just, you know, they move in sort of different circles and their friends are not necessarily Afrikaans. And, and like, she's from Johannesburg. Johannesburg is a very English-type area. Um, where I'm in Pretoria, where it's far more Afrikaans. But the, 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 the South Africa in general, um, you typically have to be able to speak Afrikaans. It, it's sort of because of the historical reasons. I mean, that Afrikaans was the spoken language for so many years amongst all the different cultures so that everyone can speak to each other. Um, now you can get away with not being able to speak Afrikaans depending on where you live. Yeah. Uh, you won't do so well, for instance, in Pretoria, where I live, it's better to know Afrikaans. Um, but you're not forced to learn it or anything. But yes, if you do your military service and back then and you couldn't speak Afrikaans, you would get what, what we called an OPI. Uh, O-P-P, how can I spell it? O-P-P-I-E or O-P-P-Y. Now, mm-hmm. it stands for something. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, okay. but uh, it, it, it means to be totally, you know, effed up, okay? That's what it means. Yeah. And so what happens is to you it, in, in the army, if you do something wrong uh, or whatever the case may be, the chances are very good that they're going to do that to you. And if, if they think like maybe that you've got to do push-ups for two hours, okay? If they think you're not going to learn your lesson from that or you come in with an attitude and maybe you're very good at doing push-ups and you can't do it for two hours, then they're just going to tell you, I mean, they do this in, in military all over the world, but they're going to tell you to go stand under a tree in the shade and enjoy yourself. And then everyone else they're going to give this oppie to. So... You don't want to cause trouble because then your own buddies are going to come and you know beat you up because they had to go through this hell for a couple of hours. Yeah. But but Afrikaans was sort of the the spoken language back then. Yeah. Um, today a little bit less, but it's still very much uh, in use. Very much. Well, that's it. I I usually I listen to a lot of like if I'm learning a specific language, I listen to a lot of music, and I really uh, enjoy uh, the Hoovels Fantastis and uh, yes, yeah, yeah, the I, Van Gogh, and yeah, those guys, and Bok van Blerk. I like his stuff as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. we we just call him Bok. Bok, yeah. yeah. You know, actually, so, so what yeah. happens is a, a lot of our Afri- Afrikaans singers, um, because the Afrikaans community is very very tightly knit and so forth, so. You know, we, we're very much into, like, if someone's a little bit older than you, you, you call them auntie or uncle, you know, woman, Tani. Um, it's, it's, it's respect. Um, it's, it's not as much as it was a couple of decades ago, you know, the young people nowadays. But, but 
a lot of kids that are still brought up very very Afrikaans. They, they still have that 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 respect and so forth. But but then, by the same token, even if you're not a family member, but but people want to, you know, like let's say you're a very good singer, for instance, they, they won't call you, you know, Bok van Black. You just Bok. Okay. They call you in the first name. That's what it, what I'm trying to get to. Uh, ah, it's a okay. kind of a way of saying that we're so close to this person, you know, we we can refer to them on their first name. But then you'll say, but why can't they do that to older people as well? Because a lot of older people, you know, they try and make a point of it. No, no, no. You know, you, you're not that young anymore. You are now 40 or 50 or whatever. You can't call me, you know, uncle anymore. So, but it's just hmm. a sign of respect. You just, you do it anyway. Um Interesting, so, yeah. yeah. You know, um, what does bok mean? What does that mean in Afrikaans? Well, the actual word bok would be a buck. Um, oh, okay. You know, like a, a, an antelope. Um, oh, okay. And, and so, so a lot of Afrikaans names, for instance, are normally associated with something. Um, yeah. Not necessarily something as direct as like a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a sock or something like that, but but something has got more meaning, and like a bok is one of them. Um, where guys will have that name. Um, you know, Afrikaans people they they came through a lot of their own strifes and so forth uh, from the 1800s, and they went through a lot of stuff. And they also, you know, the farmers and the in the bush and so forth. So a lot of the the names and so forth are associated with with their backgrounds, and yeah. you know. It, yeah, yeah. I've done I've done some reading on uh, the Boer War and uh, you know some of the stuff that uh, happened in that and re- and happened as a result of that and and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very mm. you know interesting. Yeah, well, a lot of people lot don't of know is so. that uh, you know some Africa or a lot of Afrikaans people, yeah, were stuck in concentration camps. Yeah, like yeah. they had in the Second World War. It, well, it happened to the Afrikaans people here as well. By the Brits, the British stuck them in concentration camps, the women and the children. Yeah. That's, um, but that's, then again, what a lot of people don't know is in Southwest Africa, Namibia, there's a there's an indigenous tribe they called the Hereros, and they went through something similar. They were also stuck into like concentration camps and stuff. So you know, the sadness has gone all over the world. It's it's terrible. It's it's just terrible. Yeah, I've seen some of the photographs from around that time and how people were treated as just. Uh... Just dis- disturbing. It's very disturbing. It is disturbing, yeah. um, but that sort of wipes out of history. Yeah, um, th- those things don't really come up in conversation and so forth, um, except amongst like Afrikaans speaking to Afrikaans. But even then, uh, you know, people sort of don't really talk about those things anymore. It's tragic. Um, so, yeah. all right, let's let's switch over to uh, your Linux history. I'm interested in how you how you were first introduced, how you became a Linux user developer. Yeah, so I can't remember exactly when um, I first. Okay, so obviously back in the '90s, I mean, we there was no such thing as internet and so forth. I think internet really only became big in South Africa in in the second half of the '90s, like. 96, 97, around there. Um, but even then, it was quite small. So, I mean, you'll also hear, I try and say Linux, but I'm actually trained to say Linux. Yeah, and the reason cool. for that is, is because that back then, I mean, we had no videos or anything to, to listen to and look at. Okay, so it was all written down. You know, it's all documentation. So, I mean, I've never seen the word Linux before. So... Based on you know my knowledge and the way I pronounce words and so forth, and a lot of South Africans would uh, Linux is the word that you would come up with because you you don't hear anyone saying the word Linux. You don't you can only read it. Right. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like for instance uh, uh, Ubuntu. Um, and I see a lot of guys say Ubuntu, uh, but it's Ubuntu. But but I know that because that's the word from here. All right. right. Yeah. But they obviously won't know because they just read these things or they hear Ubuntu from another guy that yeah. you know only knows Ubuntu. So you know, so, so I don't get too you know stuck up with oh you, you're saying it wrong or whatever. Uh, it's fine. It doesn't well, matter. You know, I was going to say that they uh, Ubuntu used to or Ubuntu they used to uh, actually include a video with Nelson Mandela uh, speaking about the word and its origin and what it means, how it means community and and uh, giving uh, care to others and, and that, that sort of. 
So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, th- that is what it means. So, yeah. But I must say, um, I, sorry, I'll get back to the, the Linux thing now, but I must say that, like, this, this Ubuntu, I almost said Ubuntu myself now, um, this Ubuntu word, um, you don't actually really ever hear it being used, you know, uh, by, you know by the people here. Um, it's not part of the language or anything you know, as such. So, you know, what was his name? Mark Shuttleworth. He, he chose it for, for some reason. He probably did some research, found this, and used it. Now, they, they did at a stage, like on, on television, they were, I can't remember, a couple of years ago, they would say a few things, um, and, and Ubuntu would come up into it. But then it died again. So it's not really a, a majorly used word. But it is a, a local word from here. I'm not even sure if it's a, a Zulu word, or I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, that's the other thing here with languages. You do have, you know, big separations in in in, in the groups. Um, let, let's call them tribes. If we go back far enough, they were they were tribes, okay. Um, but nowadays, everyone sort of understands certain languages. Uh, like Zulu, for instance, um, and Sutu, um, they, they all sort of understand each other's words to a degree. So they, they can all talk to you know to each other. When I say they, I'm referring to those that that can actually talk an indigenous language. Now, a lot of white people can't. My father, for instance, he grew up on a farm and he could speak Zulu absolutely fluently. Wow. And uh, his mother, my granny. Um, she she was beyond ridiculous when, when it came to speaking Zulu and so forth. Um, but but most white people don't really speak a, a, a black language, if I can call it, um, because of history. We've never needed to. Um, you know, back in the day, they would speak Afrikaans. And nowadays, basically, you know, it's all business and so forth. So, so everyone is speaking English. Um, so... You know, you'll find like like Afrikaans, for instance, like as like I said in, in Pretoria, Afrikaans. You know, it's best to know Afrikaans or even Cape Town and you know in the Free State and so on. Know your Afrikaans, but when it comes to business, even Afrikaans people speak to each other in English because <laughs> hmm, it's just weird. you know yeah. it's sort of the spoken when it comes to business. That's a language that everyone speaks. Yeah, but okay, trade. so sorry, I went off on a side thing there. No, go ahead, you're go asking ahead. about my Linux knowledge, or how I got involved in that. Yes. So, so back then, um, so obviously he was playing around with. Uh, I was playing with DOS, and then a while later, Windows three or three point one is the first one I used, and then three point one one. But around about that time, because I think uh, uh, Linus started working on, on, I think the first official release of Linux was 1993 or 1994. And it is a, more or less that time, 93, 94, when I got to know about it. Um, I don't know how, because like I say, we didn't have the internet. Uh, there were bulletin boards, PBSs, but I don't think I got that info from there. So I have no idea how I got to hear about it initially. But then I started playing around with it um, uh, the, the the first distro that I got was actually Red Hat, um, and I had to buy it. Now, when I say buy, you're obviously paying only for the packaging and so forth. But, I mean, I couldn't download it from anywhere like we can today. I actually had to go into a shop and buy it. And it was Red Hat, um, if I remember correctly, my first one, and I played around with it, and, you know, like all of us got stuck and got mad and whatever, and <laughs> leave it for a week, and then I'm back at it again. Um, and the first graphical interface I used, if I remember correctly as well, was, um, uh, what is that? Uh, it's uh, Enlightenment. Yeah, Enlightenment. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, that's the first one I, I worked on um, or played around with. And that was also, uh, oh, I don't know, Enlightenment maybe about 96, 97 around there. Um, and then, but the thing is, I was still very much in the Microsoft world. Um, so my main operating system was Windows. Um, then, you know, as the years progressed, um, nowadays everyone's using VirtualBox and so forth. But before that, um, what was that one that everyone was using? Uh, it was VMware Workstation. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I would run Linux a lot inside that. And uh, every now and then when I hear something new, well, okay, that's the other thing also. Basically, no one knows Linux, or, well, I suppose worldwide, but like in South Africa, you can go 20 years without meeting anyone that knows Linux. They'll know the name, 
but they've never used it. They don't know that there's such a thing as different distros. You know, telling them like, oh, no, I, I'm on Arch, not on, um, <laughs> there I said it, <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> oh, by the way, I am on Arch though. <laughs> but but, um, but like trying to explain the difference, for instance, between uh, Arch and uh, um, Ubuntu, you know, like it's foreign concepts or that you can choose your desktop environment it's completely foreign to 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 most people because they they understand you know windows and that's it um but anyway so i can't remember what we were saying now um but moving on on, on with with linux and so forth so so i try to keep myself going with it all the time and uh you know but but in a virtual machine and uh then uh what is it uh, uh mono um, became a thing, so I don't know if you know Mono. It's sort of it's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a .NET framework for 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 Linux, and uh, and me coding in C Sharp at that stage, I thought I got to try this out, and uh, the IDE I used back then was called Mono Develop, and uh, I played around in that, and hey, I was amazed because C Sharp worked on Linux. Uh, thanks to Mono. I mean, it couldn't do uh, wooden forms and stuff like that, but I wasn't writing stuff like that. I was writing DLLs and stuff. So I thought it was just amazing. Um, and then, you know, as time progressed, I was fiddling with it. I, I would always fiddle, fiddle, fiddle. And then, because the internet became bigger and bigger, and then you could start getting information and, you know, getting more and more excited. And then a few years ago, um, I, I, I became ill, and uh, I, so I couldn't work. And I, I was sort of a bit anti, um, let's say, everything that I've been through. And, and programming, software development fell under that as well. I said, never again. I'm changing my life entirely. I want none of those things in my life again. And uh, definitely nothing to do with Microsoft and Windows. I, just, I was tired of that world. And then... A few months later, I was, I was thinking, but, you know, what am I good at and what do I really enjoy? And it took me back to programming and computers and, you know, just IT. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to take this opportunity and I'm going to make a complete switch. I'm going 100% Linux and that's it. And that's what I did. Wow. Every, every computer in my house, I just formatted and boom, I stuck Linux on. And... Um, now, I had uh, uh, installations you know, uh, on, on bare metal. For, uh, it wasn't always in virtual machines, but it was normally like you know, my main desktop was whatever version of Windows, and then on a laptop, that will have some Linux distro on it, uh, whatever the flavor of the day was. I mean, um, also, so something I must mention back in the 90s as well, I, I fiddled around a lot with uh, uh, OpenSUSE. Okay. Uh, see, there also, everyone says SUSE, and I just know it as SUSE. Because I didn't hear the word when I yeah. was using it. It works um, for me. So to it's me, it was a Sus, yeah. And then the other one that I used uh, back in the day as well was um, it got renamed to Mandrake, I think it was. Yeah, Mandriva. Um, yeah, yeah. It Mandriva. Was, there yeah. we go. Mandriva. Yeah. yeah. A red, so I played red around red with red. that as well. Yeah. Heck yeah, that um, was my first distro. Yeah, I, I quite enjoyed that actually. Um, I was quite happy with that. Um, but so yeah, so so that's really when I decided to to make the switch. Um, it's it's not the, the hundred percent switch. So like I said, I, I've I've enjoyed playing with Linux since the nineties, early nineties, um, no later than ninety four, ninety five at least, probably ninety four around there. Um, and then I've made a permanent switch about two and a half years ago or so. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, but but I must say I'm. I'm very sad about the current state of Linux. <laughs> that's a, um, that's yeah. That's was going to be my next question. Like your opinion of of uh, of the uh, you know the Linux uh, desktop experience today. So I think the desktop experience is absolutely marvelous. Um, well, obviously we're talking which distros and which desktop and whatever. But I mean, if you narrow it down to what you want, and I think it's so capable. Now, one must understand that. Linux was created by and, and for techies, for technical guys, all right? Um, and this is sort of, I won't say it, it held the, the, the desktop environments back. It's just, I think that, like, let's take Linus, for instance, himself and, and his core teams back in the day. That wasn't really their aim, all right? 
Um, they were just looking at a kernel, and then everything on, must be stuck on top of that. And, and then you get, you know, the guys that had their own little projects that they would come on and start adding. Like, you know, KDE, I think that's also from the 90s, if I remember. They started, and, and like Enlightenment and so forth. These were things that were added on, but by small teams of guys that were doing their own little thing. And they would come up with environments that they wanted, that they liked. It was for them. And, and you know, this is the great thing about, about Linux distros versus Windows. If you don't like the Windows UI, the look and feel. I mean, I was playing with Windows 11 today, and I, I call it Windows 10.1, which it, it's not really uh, okay. But that's a different subject. Um, no, go ahead. So that's interesting. <laughs> no, so I think the Linux desktop experience is amazing. Okay, the, 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 anything that I want to do, I can do. Now the thing is, you can say, okay, what about gaming? All right, uh, like with Steam. Now. I'm not a gamer anymore. I, I played games up until the age of 44, and I just stopped dead the one day. Um, and since then, I haven't played again. So I'm not too worried about gaming on Linux. I, I like the idea that it's getting better, and I hope it really gets massive. But that doesn't bug me too much. But all the other things, the things that I'm interested in, everything works on Linux. Um, so I think the desktop experience is absolutely amazing. But, now this is the, the, the little but that, that worries me about Linux's future. So something I've said for a long time, now I hope I don't get shot by, this, by, by people in my future, but the, the sad thing about uh, engineers, for instance, have the exact same problem. You know, they, they want to go and, and reinvent the world, they, you know, or some scientist. They know if they can just do the following, they'll find a cure for X or whatever. But then the CEO and the board of the company who works with comes back and says, now you've got a limit of a million dollars for the year, and he knows he needs five. All right? So he's held back. All right? Because business is telling him what to do. Because they're worried about, you know, the, 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 the margin, the bottom, you know, how much do things cost and so on. They worry about that. Whereas him, the scientist, doesn't really worry about that. He just wants to solve the problem. He wants to find a cure or whatever. So it's sort of, from the scientist's perspective, it's, the business is sort of holding him back. Okay? So the, we have a similar situation when it comes, for instance, to, to software development. So, I mean, many projects that I've worked on, then, you know, they ask you, we, we've got the following problem, and how long will it take to fix or to, to write something for it? And you say, ah, oh, okay, two months. And they say, or, or, or $100,000, all right? Yeah, let, let's say $100,000. They say, nah, we've only got 60. You know, they say, ah, oh, okay, I'll make it happen. But, but you can't really, you know, it's not enough money, which means you don't have the time to do it and so forth. So you don't really invest properly into it. And I think we're having a similar problem with, with, with Linux and business. So we've always wanted business to take Linux more serious, all right? which they now have, all right? Linux is used by the, the biggest companies in the world. I mean, I mean Microsoft. I remember when, what was it, uh, 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 Steve, uh, what is it, uh, Balmer was saying about uh, Linux is a cancer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, if it wasn't for Linux, Microsoft probably doesn't have a future, um, you know, with Azure and so forth. And so a lot of big, big companies are getting involved in Linux which we would initially think, oh, that's brilliant. We finally got the big boys investing in it and so forth. But the problem is now they are guiding its direction, not the technical guys that actually sit and play with it and made it happen. So it's like this, this programmer that he knows he needs two months to write something well, but his boss tells him, some project manager tells him, Look, you've got three weeks. Make it happen. You know you're going to write bad software. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that it's a good thing that business is now more involved in Linux, you know, along like with the Linux Foundation and so forth, but that's another conversation. But so in a way, it's a good thing that they're getting involved because then more people are using Linux, big companies are involved, so big money is involved, and so they can spend more time on, on, on developing Linux. But then the bad side comes in. Um, you know, it's those companies that decide what Linux is going to be like, and you know, us, the actual people that use it daily, and the developers, the core developers, 
they have less and less of a say of the direction in which it's going. So well, I'm getting kinda, the big guys involved is great, but it's also not great. I'm kind of curious. Do you think that uh, the, you know, the provisions that the GPL provide, do you think that's some sort of, you know, an, you know, as far as the direction, even if that uh, continues in one way, do you think that is some sort of provides some sort of like safety net for? No, actually, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, you know, it. I mean, if you just look at it from the top, okay, sure. So you know, they can't make you know certain things pay for, and it's got to be open source, etc. So, so in that sense, yes, but but that doesn't change that some some big organizer, some big company, can come in and say, look. Uh, we don't want to support um, uh, System D, all right? And we're a big company. You've got to throw it out. We, we don't want to. We, we want to use uh, um, Red Hat, but we don't want System D in it. Get rid of it. They're going to get rid of it because you know the, the, these guys need to get paid. They need to get their salaries and so forth. So the GPL doesn't affect that at all. So they're going to go and make the change. They're going to get rid of System D, as an example. Um, they're going to get rid of that. Um, and everything is still covered by the GPL. And wherever those big companies that said they must do it is going to be happy. And they didn't, you know, they didn't break any laws or anything. Yeah. So in that sense, the GPL is not going to help. So the GPL really just helps in making sure that people can keep their eyes on the code. And if they want to make changes, they can take that code and go ahead and make changes. So it's your concern that like a big company could have that kind of an influence and in where uh, some program, some code may not get maintained how it would otherwise if it was being implemented, you know, yes, or approved. Yes, because I think country. there's an influence. Yeah. And, and it's typically an influence you know, uh, due to financial reasons. So, I mean, if we could all just sit back um you know, uh, we don't need a salary, and we could all sit and play around in the kernel code all day. Well, that'll be great, okay? But that's not the lives or the, the world that we live in. You know, you've got to have an income and so forth. At the moment, you, you say things like, well, I need an income, and I, my time is spent working on some software package. Let's say it's the kernel. Um, and I, I need some kind of remuneration for that. At the moment, that's the situation. Boom, you're, you are open to be influenced because someone can turn around and say to you, okay, your, 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 your package per month is, I don't know, $10,000. I don't know. I don't, sorry, I'm not from the United States. So uh, no, 10000 <laughs> might be a bit high. I don't know. <laughs> but let's do a nice round number. So, so you might be getting 10000 a month, and then this big organization comes in and tells you, well, we're going to give you 15000 okay, if you, if you make this little change, which you don't really want to do, but we'll give you 15000 then it's this whole way up where, you know, your heart lies here, but you do want the money. Right. You know? and, and, and some guys are going to say, I don't care about the money. And I'm going to stick to this and I'm going to keep it pure. But even just that one guy that decides, no, I actually want that 15 grand. But not necessarily because he's, you know, he, he wants money. You know, he's got his own personal issues. Maybe somebody's in hospital and he needs money to, to help them or something. Um, but their influence starts coming into it. Um, and, 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 I, and I see it. And I see the influence. Um, there, there, there's things happening, you know, which, which makes me nervous. Yeah. Uh, I don't know enough about what is exactly happening in the kernel. I don't, the work, don't work on the kernel. I, I've, I've gone so far as to download and look at some of the code as if I knew what's going on. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not really. Those guys are good that write that. Yeah. But... But 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 I can make comments on, on, on certain things and so forth. But but yes, I'm I'm scared of that influence from 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 big companies. And so we want to deal with big companies because we want to show them how amazing Linux is. And then when they say yes, we want your stuff, then we get nervous. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. That's, that's sort of where I am. That's it's like, hey, look at this amazing thing, <laughs> but don't use it. Just say it's amazing. Yeah, that's always Just admit been... to the fact that it's better than what you're using at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's all. All we want is an admission, not, <laughs> not adoption. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of always been in the back of my mind. It's like if Linux became like the adopted choice for, um, you know, OEMs and they start shipping it out, does that fundamentally 
I mean, it kind of, by necessity, has to fundamentally change the way that the experience is going to go. I mean, like, look at, like, Chromebooks or, or Android. Yes. You know, those are those are one of my, you know, two of my favorite examples because they're not what what I would think of as a Linux or a Linux, right? And mm, because it's yeah. not it's not a, a, a system that's completely open to, for me to do, you know, anything that I, I would like to do on my system. And so, you yeah. know, that's all, I, I kind of understand the, the concern, you know, where, where you're coming from there. And, it's, you know, we'll see how it, I guess we'll see how it plays out. Over but next, that, that's uh, why I'm sort of, um, I've been interested in, in, in uh, um, what was it, FreeBSD. For, yeah. uh, I haven't done much with it, so I can't really get in depth on it. But I have played around with it for a few years um, and then different flavors of it. Um, like uh, what was that one? Uh, Ghost Ghost BSD. Oh, that's I a think good there's one. a Midnight yeah. BSD as well, if I remember. Um, now, uh, which is the last one I played with? It was Ghost, but you get the XFCE version as well, and and I, I use XFCE. Um, uh, strangely enough, actually, I was thinking about it today. Um, where did I see? Oh, it was Windows Windows 11. Um, looking at its UI. And I was just thinking, you know, like oh, eye candy and everything. And, and I've used Cinnamon, uh, the desktop, for instance. And, you know, you make changes and make it look the way you want it and everything. It's all cute and pretty. And then I find that these things actually irritate me. Because, like, <laughs> I want to work now. I've got work to do. You know, and, and, and like a window, you know, maximizing from the bottom left corner up and filling up the screen. And then when I minimize it, it goes down again like on a Mac. That's pretty. It's really pretty. I, I, I have no issues. But for me, when I'm actually working, it, it sort of irritates me. And so I got all excited when I saw this, uh, uh, I think it was GhostBSD. Um, it's got this XFCE version. I said, oh, I've got to try that out. Um, and then when I installed the thing, um, I was doing it in an, uh, a QMU. And I couldn't get a screen resolution of greater than 1024 by 768. No matter what I did. I tried so many different combinations huh, of things. It, I couldn't get it to work. Um, so I thought, well, it seems to be fine. It, it's great and you know, all good. But the screen resolution irritates me. But give it another few weeks or months, that'll be sorted as well. So the, my, my future is definitely Linux for, for many years to come still. But I, I am getting very interested in the, the OpenBSD and FreeBSDs out there. Um, I mean, I, I wrote an application uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, I, I, I call it CryoZerk. Just, I, d I couldn't think of a better name at this stage. You know, like, Sounds cool. Who came up with Bluetooth? So, so <laughs> yeah. I came up with CryoZerk, yeah. So, um, so it, it's, it's, all, it's this thing. It's all about encrypting stuff, and you can stick stuff on the web. And it's all encrypted, and you can do backups. It's it's perfectly safe, and but but this isn't trying to sell that. Well, it's free, so it's not for sale. But okay, so it's not trying to sell that. But but pure chance, um, I did a Open BSD installation today as well, just to see what it's like now and so forth. And I installed it, and I thought, you know what? I want to see if CryoZerk will run on it because because CryoZerk is multi-platform, so it's it's written in Rust. And it works on uh, any distro of Linux that I've tried so far. I've tried many. Um, which you expect. It should work, if it works on one, it will work on all of them. Um, so it's, it's uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, Windows, and BS, uh, OpenBSD and FreeBSD. Now, the BSD ones, I've only tried the client because it consists of a client and the server. And then today I decided on OpenBSD, let's install the server. And then as an addition to the server, you've got the option of using uh, MongoDB for, for persistence as, as your database. And I thought, well, all right, let's stick on MongoDB onto this OpenBSD as well. But I had no idea how to get MongoDB onto this thing. And I finally figured out, and I started downloading and doing the installation. I saw, but hang on a second. This is like version 3.3 or something like that, where as it's already on version 4.4, 4.5 or something. So I was like, oh, I wonder if this is going to work. And, but I let the installation complete. I started up my server, and everything just worked as it is. So just by pure luck and happiness, I wrote this program. I tried it on OpenBSD, and it just worked. Wow. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. so, so what I'm saying is for me to, to do a switch over well, I shouldn't say a switch, but to to concurrently use Linux and uh, OpenBSD, 
I don't think it's going to be for me much of an issue because uh, a lot of the things that I need um, will run on both. Uh, that's why I was saying XFC just now because this installation of, um, what is it now again, uh, Ghost BSD that I use the XFC, XFCE one and it was XFC. It, just, it worked. It was XFC. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's all I gotta say on that. So I, 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 I'm still, I love my Linux, and I'm gonna stick with it. But yeah. I am gonna be investigating things such as BSD. That's cool. Yeah, I like, uh, I like some of the words you use are the same in English and Afrikaans. So it's like, it's like still, right? <laughs> still is yeah yeah but they, it's the they, same they mean different things there oh yeah yeah yeah. yes i just yeah so i just so still yeah. uh, in afrikaans is quiet ah yeah yeah to <laughs> just play like, still means keep quiet what is it blay b-l-y yeah it means to 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 stay or keep like blind, um, blind so stall. Ek blay dar. <laughs> I live there or I stay there. So blay means stay. Yeah. Okay. But it can also mean keep. So, so blay stall is keep quiet. That is, uh, yeah, I, 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 I like learning languages. Afrikaans is like, it just sounds so cool. <laughs> it does actually, you know, I've yeah, actually tried cool. to sometimes switch off to, because, you know, I don't want to hear, I don't want to interpret what's being said. I just want to listen to the language. Yeah. And it's a very interesting, smooth, flowing kind of language. Very interesting. Yeah, oh. I, I like it. Okay, so I was going to, yeah. The, no, they do say it's probably the most uh, um, uh, florally beautiful language in the world because you, you can use very few words to describe absolutely amazing things. Um, it's it's very expressive, extremely expressive. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a beautiful language. It really is. Yeah, I'm, but like, I don't know if it's going to be a mainstay language in South Africa for you know. Is it going to be around in a hundred years time? Um, yeah, you never know. Right? Maybe I, I don't yeah. know. Maybe it's you like, know the whole world. You know, moving up, start talking English and so forth. Yeah. Um, Afrikaans people typically speak Afrikaans only socially nowadays. You know. Yeah, but not business wise, it's English. Stuff, yeah. 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 I think, I mean, but English is, you know, it's pretty much a trade language in a lot of, well, anyone, you know, does business with, you know. Yeah, most West, definitely. So, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I've been saying that as well. Yeah. And a lot of people actually got upset with me when I said that like 20 years ago, 25 <laughs> years ago. And I said, like, guys, you're going to have to learn English. Yeah. You know, no, no, we speak that. No, no, no. You're going to have to learn English. <laughs> and now, yeah, now they all speak English. Well, I was kind of curious about it because I, I discovered you your content on YouTube and you cover like a whole lot of stuff from uh, software to, you know, just all kinds of interesting things. But I was wondering what uh, con what uh, tools you use, like as far as to create your content. And do you do that? You do that on uh, Linux? I yeah, so yeah. I, I'm, on, I'm on Linux. So, so my, my main operating system is in Endeavor OS, which is uh, an arch system. Okay. Um, uh, my desktop environment, like I said, is uh, CE. Um, actually, this is a, a reasonably fresh install. I think I, it's about two months ago. I think I stuck it on. But um, for for my my video content creation is um, way back. I used to use OBS. Um, I didn't I didn't know any better anything else to use. I used OBS uh, a little bit. It irritated me a little bit. I thought it's a bit heavy for what I'm actually trying to do. And then by pure chance, I came across, uh, what is this thing called? It's either Simple Screen Recorder or Easy Screen Recorder, uh, Simple Screen Recorder. So I came across Simple Screen Recorder and I found that, because all I really want to do is record my desktop and my voice, um, not, not a, a video of me, because the reason for that is, is my hardware. I didn't have a, a good camcorder. Um, so I, I thought oh, I have to so don't record. In other words, my my, my face. Yeah. Um, so I don't need OBS. In other words, I just want something easy just to capture my screen. And that's what this uh, I forget the name again. What does it? Simple yeah. screen recorder. Simple screen recorder yeah. does. Yeah. So I use uh, sc simple screen recorder, uh, Audacity, <laughs> and uh, KDN Live. Very cool. Yeah. That's that's basically what I use. It's, um, uh, 
it's so common. Like, yeah, I've, I've asked other people and they've, you know, the, that's pretty common. Uh, Simple Screen Recorder, Canadian Live, these are like, yeah. uh, not that. So Canadian Live, I, 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 sorry, uh, Audacity, I mean. Yeah. Uh, I've known about or, or I've been using Audacity since, gosh, I, I actually can't remember. As far back as I can remember, I've used Audacity. So if I say to you, you know, since the year 2000, maybe they weren't around then. But I can't even remember when I started. I've always, I mean, on Windows, I used Audacity for yeah. years. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I tried OpenShot at a stage, um, I, but I prefer my Acadian Live. And there's many things or many features that pack, software packages have, but I find I don't need all these features. So I'm pretty sure there's better things out there than, than the three I just mentioned now. There must I'm be sure. yeah. <laughs> better stuff. But I don't need those other features. Yeah. It's, it's like saying to me, you know what, uh, you need to write a website, okay? Um, just a very basic website. It's, it's just going to ask you your age and then, or your name, and then it's going to do an alert and say you, you entered and this is your name, all right? And then I'm going to say, oh, cool, great. I'm going to go and write that in Rust. And you say, no, 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 you don't want to write this in Rust. Okay, no, C. No, dude, HTML, that's all you need to do. I mean, JavaScript, yeah. you know. So, oh, okay, so all these extra fancies, you know, just because they're there, you know, maybe if they're there and they're easy to use, I'll grow into that and start using it. But at the moment, uh, I don't really find anything missing out of, like I say, a simple screen recorder, Audacity, and Cadian Live. Yeah. yeah, I'm on board with that Basically, idea. Use the, yeah. the simplest tool to get the job done that you want to do. Exactly. Like, you know, what do they say about programming? A few lines of the, the, what, I can't think of the exact words now, but the, le the less lines of code there are, the fewer bugs there will be. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so the ultimate perfect program consists of no code. <laughs> <laughs> no bugs, right? No problems. No bugs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. Certainly, if you're like if you're programming um, and you're doing something very specific, yeah, you want to use the simplest and with the fewest lines of code. But as far as like uh, application stuff, sometimes it is hard to you know to know uh, you know if there's a simpler solution a solution out there, unless you just want to make something yourself, I guess. Yeah, but, but, but that, that's actually very true what you're saying. So, so I, I often want to make this video, but I haven't done it yet. So it was basically two videos. Um, but I, this is why I haven't made it yet. So I was thinking about combining them into one, but I can't, I can't decide. So my, my question is, is why do people get so religious about their operating system? And the same thing is, why do people get so religious about their programming language? Okay, yeah. so the thing is, if, if you don't understand that uh, like certain operating systems, okay, well, the unmentionable ones we won't mention, but you know, like for instance, let's take Ubuntu versus Arch, right? I will not stick Arch on a server as a server operating system. I'd rather stick Ubuntu on, all right? The whole rolling release thing and so on. I don't want that on my server. Yeah, it could be dangerous. Um, <laughs> yeah, Unstable. So, but, but, but Arch has got its place as well because maybe in some cases you do want the latest stuff immediately, all right? So, so you choose why you install which one. And the programming languages are the exact same. You know, if, if, if somebody comes along and says they want to rewrite Windows Notepad, okay, you don't go and write the thing in Assembler. You know, nice. if, since it's Windows Notepad, it's Windows, you might as well open up Visual Studio, open up C Sharp, WinForms app, spend half an hour, boom, done, there's Notepad, an hour, there's Notepad. Um, even though a guy that knows Assembler can say to you, Yo, I could have done an Assembler and I would have direct access to it and it's much faster. And Why do you need super speed when all you're doing is typing text? <laughs> what what for you know? <laughs> yeah. So so use it the tool for the for the job. So when somebody comes along and says, "Look, C is the best. That is just it. Or Rust is the best. Or Go or whatever." For a particular use case, it is yes, but not for everything. That's why it's so difficult to come across. You know, one 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 language is good at everything. Now I'll I will say this about C Sharp. It is a brilliant language. I do think it's been muddied a bit the last few years, 
But the, the basic idea behind C Sharp is brilliant. And I mean, who, uh, what's his name? Anders Halsberg. Uh, he was at Borland, actually. He moved over to Microsoft and, and started working on, on the creation of C Sharp. So, I mean, it comes from a, a good brain and so forth that figured C Sharp out. And it, it's really, really good. But it's not C. And just because it has a C in it, don't compare <laughs> it to C. Yeah. You know, yes, you can compare it because there's squiggly bra bra braces inside there. But that's about it. Um, and, and Rust also has squiggly braces. Well, well, does that mean it's similar to C++ or, or C Sharp or Java? No, they each fit into their own, you know, their own use case. Um, so coming along saying this is the best in the world, uh, depends what you want to write. Yeah, I'm like I've said before, I'm not really a developer or programmer, but I if I am going to make something, I just you know, I choose the simple the absolute simplest, most basic thing that I can find to get it done because, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't wanna there's no reason to, to uh get a whole whole bunch of stuff well, going well, on. Well you see you know? so 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 there's the other side as well. So if somebody knows C, for instance, so extremely well. Yeah. They are so well versed that they, they, they can code C faster than JavaScript. All right. Then they might have an if, if you come to that person and say, Well, I need you to write the following, um, and you know, a good solution would have been JavaScript, let's say now, all right. And then this guy, you know, you, you as the 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 the, the the person that's saying, you know, I want the following written, you, you mention the fact that JavaScript will be a good fit, but they don't respond in any way. They see, okay, you want the following written, and you want it when? In three days' time. Okay, cool. He goes back, sits at home, he or she starts typing this thing out. One day later, they're finished. They come show you the app, and it works brilliantly, and, uh, you know, they give you the source code because you purchased it, and it's yours, and off you go. And, uh, but you don't look at the source code as long as your app works. Six months later, you want to make a slight change, and you get a web developer to come along, that you use their JavaScript skills and do an update, and boom, uh, they find out it was never written in JavaScript, it was written in C. Well, well, there's a third thing we've touched on now about which is the right language to use. But what I'm getting at is, if somebody is extremely well-versed in a certain language, then sometimes it's better to use that language to, to, to create some solution yeah, um, that makes versus sense, yeah. taking the time to learn something new and so forth. But, I mean, when you're dealing with, dealing with big business... Um, I mean, the company I work for now, I, I've been trying to get Rust in, and even Assembler. For, but, but I keep saying, you know, we can't, we, this is not to replace like websites and stuff. That's not what you use those languages for. But there are cases where they, they, they could be used. Um, but the problem is, and this is a very valid issue, I'm the only one in the company that knows Rust. All right? So I die. And I, yeah. I'm half faced to writing some amazing project. Okay, who's going to continue with it? Um, you know, the, I've only heard of one other Rust developer in South Africa. Now, I, I'm pretty sure there's a thousand or whatever, okay? But what I mean is I've only physically heard from someone else that they know a, a Rust developer. So that's me, and then through somebody, I've heard that there's another one. It's, it's like Linux as well, for instance, here in South Africa. You, you'll hear of someone, there's somebody that exists but I've never met them, spoken to them, seen them. You just hear of someone. Yeah. You know, so I don't know what it's like in the States, but you guys. It's you know, not it, too dissimilar, I guess. I mean, yeah, it, I don't know. The, the As far as like meeting people that actually use uh, Linux, it's, um, it's pretty rare, honestly. It's pretty rare. Okay. So, so, so yeah, so it's a worldwide thing um, when it comes to Linux. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was saying you know, many years ago. Why, why? I mean, I used OS2. Um, I coded in OS2 back in 1990, uh, I think, four. 1994, yeah, I coded in OS2. And then uh, a little while after that, yeah, actually, that is, it was 94 because uh, uh, OS2 uh, version 3 warp was coming out uh, as a competitor to Windows 95. All right, and I was saying back then, the, the, or since then, the reason Windows became actually the big name, and not OS2, for instance, is Microsoft's marketing. Absolutely brilliant marketing, and and 
you know, they would say like back, I don't know what it was like anywhere else in the world, but like in South Africa, IBM made a point. If you steal, if you uh, copy uh, OS2, all right, and they catch you, they will take you to court. They will freaking, you will be fined. Microsoft said, yeah, yeah you, you'll be fined. But they never did anything. So everyone knew, okay, well, go make a copy of, of Windows <laughs> because yeah. nothing will happen to you. And, and, but that was a brilliant move on their side because what happened is most people got to know Windows and they would tell their bosses or they would tell, their, the, you know, us youngsters will tell the parents, okay, well, I was too old in the 90s to be one of those youngsters, but, but let's, let's take somebody that was, you know, 15 in, in 1995. They start getting introduced to Windows 3.1, then Windows 95, and so forth. And by the time they, 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 they seek employment, you know, let's say in the year 2000, they will be telling their boss and so forth, oh, you should be running Windows. You know, yeah. they, they can give reasons why, because they've been using it themselves for five, six, seven years. And boom, Microsoft got into business now. And now businesses are using Windows. And it just progressed from there. And, and no one ever really questioned, well, is it the best choice? Um, it's just, well, everyone's using Windows. It's like uh, Office, Microsoft Office. Um, I mean, who, who uses all the features in, in Office? Well, very, very few people. You don't need to purchase Microsoft Office just to write basic letters and a, a nice spreadsheet. And, and it, uh, you can do all those things in, 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 in LibreOffice, you know? Yeah. Free. And, yeah. and it runs <laughs> on Windows, you know? Why are you going to buy, you know, Office 365 or whatever? I might as well say one thing. When I do say that, I, I found out something the other day. Um, Microsoft is uh, something what they call their graph API. And that allows you to use or, or to communicate via the web. So doing JSON calls and so forth, the REST calls, all right? You can actually update a, a cell in an Excel spreadsheet on the other side of the world by using Graph API. I thought that was, that, that was the first time I thought that, okay, Office is good because <laughs> that is an amazing yeah. feature. That is really amazing. So you can send email and all sorts of stuff. Um, that, that is really good. So they created this entire API that you can communicate and actually update documents and all sorts of things from all over the world. And it, it's, that is good. But I still won't buy it. Um, yeah. but, but I thought that was, that was nice. And I think um, maybe back to your point, other than you know, obviously business or something like that, international yeah. business or whatever, I mean, the, the majority of people that are me using it aren't going to be focused in on that feature you know they, yeah, they won't no, no, they won't totally. need it yeah yeah no 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 100 percent uh big business will but yeah absolutely you know, for the normal person i mean i i can use uh office for free uh, for the company i work with i can use it but i don't i use libre office that's what i work on yeah you know that's what i do it's yeah yeah what is what is but it even uh you know you were mentioning skype earlier um mm -hmm. I almost got, uh, almost installed Skype um, <laughs> so that I can chat to you and so forth. Then I thought, but hang on, I've got uh, Microsoft Teams running. Oh, yeah, Teams, um, yeah. It's, it, it's an Electron app. Um, oh, sorry, that you asked me about languages and so forth. So I, I did Electron stuff as well. Electron is basically a Chrome web browser, and you can stick in, you know, WebAssembly and JavaScript and HTML and all that sort of stuff inside there. So, for instance, like Telegram, WhatsApp, all those clients, uh, Microsoft Teams, that's all Electron. Yeah. Um, heavy on RAM, but... I didn't okay. realize that. I didn't realize those were uh, Electron. Yeah, no, th th those are all Electron. Um, and so wh when, I, when I wanted to install Skype, and I was reading up on uh, installing Skype on Arch, because I don't like installing stuff just for fun. So I want to make sure I install the exact right versions and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that, that's from using Windows for so many years. If you install rubbish, <laughs> Windows slows down to a standstill. Yeah. So I got in that habit. I don't like installing stuff for fun or, you know, just for the hell of it. So, so I looked at Teams. Then I realized, I started reading up that you can use Teams to connect to Skype. Uh, because Teams is basically just Skype, the, the video side of it. It's just Skype on steroids. Um, so it makes sense you can speak to Skype. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm sort of running off here. I'm rambling on. You asked me a no, question. No, it's okay. But I can't, no. remember, I can't remember what it was now. Um, 
but yeah, so so Teams is also an Electron app. Um, there's quite a few. Um, it's, the great thing about Electron is it's multi-platform. It runs anywhere yeah. and everywhere. Yeah, but actually, it is I have, RAM heavy. I just have one. I've only made uh, one Electron app, and I, you know, I exported it to work on 64-bit, 32-bit Linux, then the ARM stuff for Linux, and then Windows as well. Okay. And it's just a chat oh. app that I made for my cousin, you know. But it's a, it's yeah. Electron, and I just I just made it into an app image so I can just download and run it. But you see I, that you brought up something interesting there is app images. I do love app images. They're great. Um, yeah, absolutely. My very very first video I made is uh, just a, a little couple of months after I got out of hospital. Um, it's also the only video of me where there's a recording of me in the in the bottom right hand corner. So I was making it on a laptop, but it's my my first video was how to install Nextcloud 16 without using Snap packages. Because I was anti-snap back then, and <laughs> yeah. I, to a degree I am today as well. But app images, I absolutely love it. Wow. Yeah, I mean you can't. I mean it's it's amazing. Like there hasn't been one uh, system that I've tried this. I I didn't do a multi. It's not a uh, what do you call that? A multi uh, multi architecture. I have a I think. Oh, like, okay. Yeah, I yeah. made a. Yeah. I think I did a 64-bit and a 32-bit app, app image, but there's not been one of my systems that I've tried the app image on where it doesn't just work. And it's, like, it's, it's yeah, great, you know? That's the thing. It yeah, just works. It's brilliant. It. Yeah. Yeah. And that paired with, with, uh, with Electron, it's like the perfect, you know, small little, little package of just everything you need. <laughs> it just works. Yeah. So. But, but there, there's definitely, there are guys out there that um, I've, I've come across it a lot in forums and stuff with where they just, uh, sorry, I will not use Electron apps. Um, because the one side is because it's basically Chrome, Chrome, Chromium. Yeah. Okay. It's so Chromium, it's Google yeah. and Chromium, so they worry about. Oh, I don't like that. And the other thing is, is that it's it's definitely very RAM hungry. It, uh, <laughs> yeah. it uses a lot of RAM. But like, there, me, there are like, tricks that you can do. Yeah. I, I don't know. There to are me tricks that goes, you can do to drop sorry. the RAM, but uh, there's yeah. not much you can do. You 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 know you write something very very basic. And then you think like, well, if this was written even in C sharp, well, okay, that's a bad example. Um, but something like C or Rust or whatever, then you see, okay, well, the the the, the binary will be in a hundred k, and then you go and look at the Electron one, and it's hundred and fifty meg. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's true. <laughs> but it's because of the whole browser is there. You know? Yeah. Well, my thing so. is like it's back to like what is the simple is like easiest thing to do, and and it, I probably I could have gone with like GTK Web App or Qt or something like that, but this one was just simple. I was like I just I didn't want to spend too much time on it because <laughs> this I like I'm really the only one using the the uh, desktop version of it because I did like a yeah. an Android app and you know all that kind of stuff too, but but yeah. it, it was just like the simplest uh, thing to just get it done, and you know probably not the best uh, on the resources, but. You know, whatever it works. Yeah, I often, yeah, you know, people say like, "Oh, who cares about you know 100 meg when you've got you know 32 gig RAM or whatever?" Yeah, well, sure, who cares? But but it's also the the, the, the principle. You know, if people don't keep programmers, you know, more honest, and and so these things don't get too big and bloated. You know, then then we're forcing ourselves that you know, in in 25 years time, we're each going to have a petabyte of RAM. <laughs> because you know, Notepad is yeah. half a gig in size, and it, it's you know, you got to try and optimize it and and keep it small and simple and yeah, well, it's faster and it's it's you know, typically less code as well, like we said, and therefore less bugs. Yeah. So try and keep things small and lightweight and well, quick. My my thing no. is like this isn't like like as far as my stuff, I didn't make it to be distributable to people. It's just can, it just goes right to, to yeah. my well, server. Then but, of course, yeah. yeah. But, so then, I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. yeah. I've I've done stuff like that as well. Like I mean, I, I wrote something very interesting I found today actually. So I, I wrote a uh, um, for Windows a uh, a background uh, desktop background uh, switcher. Because on my website, Dimension cool. 15, if you go into the menu, there's free stuff and blah, blah. You can, you can get onto a page that I quickly did. It's not pretty, but very quickly. And there's, there's almost 2,000 desktop backgrounds that you can, can download there. And so what I wanted to do is, for fun, write a, a desktop background changer that sits in the, 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 the sys tray of Windows. And all it does is it'll go and fetch images off, off from my website, uh, off the web. Well, it can be anywhere on the web, though. But get them off the web, and then we'll, you know, update the desktop background. But then you've got the option of uh, moving backwards in history, 
And I say, oh, I actually like the previous desktop because it, it switches every, I think it was two hours or whatever. Um, I didn't make, uh, that, it's not configurable yet, okay? You can't change it to 15 minutes or whatever. That, that's version two. But, <laughs> but what I'm getting at is, so again, I can't remember what exactly we're talking about. But So I, I wrote this, this quick desktop switcher. Now, when I installed Windows 11, I didn't activate it, all right? I didn't have an activation key for us. I said, no. Now, the thing with that is with Windows, then you can't do customizations. You know, you can't change uh, to a dark uh, a theme. You can't change the desktop background and that stuff. And the funny thing is this app of mine, I thought I'll try it just for fun and see what happens. And it actually changes the desktop backgrounds wow. in unactivated Windows, <laughs> just by fear chance. But, uh, but I think uh, uh, what made me think about this is you were saying just now, uh, you know, you sort of wrote it for yourself and whatever. Yeah, well, yeah. that I also just wrote very quickly. It's just for me to play around with. So I didn't, you know... You're supposed to, before you write something, really think about what you're going to write. Yeah. Figure out you know, a good kernel to it and then start working off of that. This, I just wrote you know, a couple of lines of code and then I thought, oh, it works. You know, it will be nice. Let's add this. And I just add it. I didn't you know, remove things or change things. So I didn't think it through. I just added the code as is. And it works. But yeah, the, the interesting thing is it'll change unactivated Windows 11's desktop background. That's cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no special work. It just yeah. by by testing it, hey, the background changed. That's amazing. It works. <laughs> <laughs> Some whole Microsoft didn't close again. Yeah, yeah, again, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you yeah. should. Maybe you can do it uh, remotely too. You could change the background. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be like, wow, it yeah. works this way too. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, is there? Um, wow, we're, oh my goodness, we're coming up on almost two hours here. Is there? Is there any other topics that we didn't cover that you that you would like to cover? Um, well, there's a million things we can talk about, but you know, <laughs> we, we, we can't keep going down the rabbit hole. Um, no, I, I think. Um, well, I mean, it's it's more you that, that that interviewed me, so so I don't know if there's something you wanted to still ask me, maybe. Um, well, I no, guess just I don't know. you're you're at uh, IT and the likes on YouTube, right? Yes. And so, what is your website? One more time. So it's dimension uh, d i m e n s i o n one five dot zero dot za. I am also on Odyssey. Um, I see on your webpage uh, you had a library and Odyssey link there as well. Yes. So I started on library way back and. Uh, then Odyssey came out. So I'm on Odyssey slash at Dimension15. Okay. Yeah, I was impressed when they went from the app to the browser. It's like, cool, you can access from the browser. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, what irritated me about the app, though, is it took over my uh, association to anything HTML. So any HTML file I open or a CSS file, anything I open, it'll always open the, this library client. And then I'd even go and I would change those settings. Really? And, nope, it'll open up the library client. And I just thought, Do you know what? It must be something small and silly. Yeah. But uh, I'm not going to be installing the client again. Yeah, and that's, that's, then that's I found, funny. oh, I can use it on the web, the, the library client on the web. Yeah. Basically the exact same as if it was the, the actual client. And then now with Odyssey, um, I'm not in library that much anymore. I'm basically just in Odyssey. Yeah, no, same, same here. And I think it's a shared network, so it goes on to both yeah. either way. So yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that was fun. That was a uh, fun. That was a fun talk. Yeah, I that was that was actually quite fun. I enjoyed that. All right. Yeah. Well, maybe we could uh, talk. And we'll do it again sometime if you have a uh, free time. Yeah. No, I'd be cool with that. Um, just uh, not because I want to vet it or anything, but uh, would I be able to get a copy of this video from you? Absolutely, um, or, yeah. I, I, uh, um, I may not have time to... Um, I was actually planning to uh, work on these today, the interview stuff, uh, but I may not actually have time to do it today, so it may be tomorrow before I can actually get it over to you, but I'll send it to you. No, 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 no Rush. Whenever you get to it, if you can just... It would be great if you could... Uh, yeah, Absolutely. No, that would yeah. be really nice. Yeah, well, great, Matt. That, I actually enjoyed talking to you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right. Chat again. See you, man. Bye. 
If you enjoyed this episode, you can join me on Locals at LibreQuest.Locals.com where I'll be posting exclusive interviews, some of my music, and other things, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about as well. For other ways to support me, you can visit LibreQuest.org, that's L-I-B-R-E-Q-U-E-S-T.org, and thank you for being a listener. Until next time, I'm Matt, and this is LibreQuest. Quest.